Hi, my name is Mark McGruther. I'm the Fish Collection Manager here at the Australian Museum. I've worked here a long, long time, nearly 30 years, but I still love it. Um, I do a whole range of things here, including mostly looking after the collection, of course, sending specimens out on loan, but of course a fair bit of my work now is working on the website and getting information out to people. And I get to see, as you can see from some of these, an incredible range of amazing different sorts of fishes. Can you tell me what is an anglerfish and whereabouts they live in general? Okay, well an anglerfish, well the first thing I should say is there's a couple of different sorts, broad categories. There's the deep water anglerfishes, such as these guys here, and the shallow water anglerfishes, which people are a lot more familiar with generally. They're all, without wanting to get technical, they're all in the order Lophiaformes. Generally they have some sort of lure on their foreheads, on their heads. Um, the deep water ones obviously are found, as you'd expect, in deeper water. There are about 11 different families and about mm, 150 species roughly. Uh, and as I said, they're generally found in deeper water, something from a couple of hundred metres down to several thousand metres in depth. Okay, Mark, so you told us about the lures. Uh, can you explain a bit more about this? What's that fancy light that they have on top of their head? Sure, sure. Well, the anglerfishes all have a lure, and the lure is made up of uh, an elysium, the long stalk-like thing, and an esker. And the esker is the light that you see on the end. And they vary in size and shape and sometimes they have uh, filaments coming off them but they all basically produce a light, a bioluminescent light and it's bacteria inside them that do it. So you see this one here, this is a, an Ellsman's whip-nosed anglerfish, you can see why it's called a whip-nose obviously and you can see the lure at the end here this is the esker with tassels coming off it, it's quite, quite distinctive. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. This guy here is Paxton's whip-nosed anglerfish, named after John Paxton, who is a research fellow here at the Australian Museum. But the tip, the esker, of this lure has actually uh, come off. This guy here is another deep water anglerfish. You can see it's got a shorter, shorter elysium and a bulbous esker on the end. Wow. So the, the eskers and the lures vary they, the yeah, they, they vary a fair bit. In fact, if we look at this guy here, when I say guy, I should say girl. <laughs> They're female. Very true. Uh, I guess we'll come on to that later. It's, it's a very, very short lure here. I've got to be very gentle with it. It's basically the, there's no stalk, no elysium. It's just the esker sitting straight there on the forehead of the fish. Okay. And so does the bioluminescence occur through its whole lifespan, or does it occur when it needs it? Well, I should, I should say uh, the life cycle, and I guess we'll get onto this later, is quite complex. The males, it's only the females that have this. The males don't have it. In fact, males, again, without jumping the gun, are quite stunted, runty little guys. <laughs> they're a lot, uh, lot slimmer, they're better swimmers and what have you. Um, when they're young, no, they don't. I mean, obviously, at what point when you start off with an egg, uh, that doesn't have a, a lure. It's only as they grow that they start to develop this feature. I hear the anglerfish mating cycle is quite unique. Would you like to explain this further, Mark? Sure, sure. It's actually quite amazing. Uh, they display extreme sexual dimorphism. In other words, the males and the females are very, very different. These are all females that you can see here on the, on the tray. They're much, much larger than the males. The males in general of deep sea anglerfishes are between about one and a half centimetres to maybe four and a half centimetres long. So much, much smaller than the females. What happens to these females, they're basically just big eating machines. They'll sit there quite happily, oh, well not sit, they'll float, not float, that's the wrong word too. They'll just remain uh, neutrally buoyant in the water with these huge mouths open, feeding, uh, attracting as we've talked about before, uh, other uh, prey with these lures. But as well as just sitting there and, um, and feeding, they're exuding a, a pheromone, a chemical that the males find quite enticing. The males uh, as I said, much smaller, but they're very slender. They're, and they're quite good swimmers, and they have hugely developed nostrils, all the better for smelling you with. And what they'll do is they'll swim up, if they're lucky and they find a, a female, because they don't feed, they've got really weak jaws and virtually no teeth, they'll swim up to the female, and uh, they'll bite onto the female. And they've actually got the males, actually, on the upper lip and the chin, they've got these hooked denticles, and they'll use these to attach to the body of the female, where they'll remain. Now, in some families, they actually become parasites on the female. And I've got a couple here to show you. 
Here's the female. I've looked at her before, but if I turn this round on the side here, you can see a male, and the male is actually fused to the female. And he becomes totally reliant on her as a parasite. This one here, same species. In fact, there's a male there. You can see his testes quite clearly there. And here's a second male. So, in some cases, you can have two, three, or even more uh, males attached to a single female, which is, uh, as you say, quite an unusual <laughs> sexual way of life. Um, you have two species here with something interesting about them. Uh, one has an interesting shape, if you'd like to explain, and the other has something interesting about their teeth, I hear. Sure, sure. Well, this one here is Johnson's Abyssal Anglerfish. And as you can see, well, I might as well start with the teeth. This is the guy we'll talk about the teeth, but I might as well talk about these guys as well. You can see they're long, long fang-like teeth. The interesting thing about these is that they're a bit like road spikes. You know, you drive over road spikes one way and they go down, drive the other way and they stay up and you puncture your tyres. Well, that's what happens with these. The teeth of these guys, when they're alive, are depressible, which means that the animal, uh, the, the, this guy, this girl, will open her mouth, uh, attack whatever it is that they're feeding on, uh, which will go inside the mouth and if it tries to get out it can't because the teeth fold back up and lock into position so basically it's a one-way trap you know you go in there you don't come out and the anglerfishes are renowned for being able to take large meals if you look at this if I hold this and sort of just push this gently I don't want to damage the fish you can see this is actually something inside the stomach of this female anglerfish wow. it's another fish probably head up this end tail up here it's a bit hard a bit hard to tell. But you can see this, this fish has had a huge last meal. Okay, the other one, we'll get back to Paxton's whip-nosed anglerfish. The thing I was going to show you about this one is that there are actually teeth not only in the jaws but also on the roof of the mouth. You have to be very careful. You see those teeth there on the roof of the mouth? Again, it's this amazing. is it's pretty incredible, isn't it? Uh, again, this is, a, I think, a one-way trip for a, a piece of prey. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, when we were on um, Tangaroa, a uh, research vessel, in 2003, one of these guys came up and it was very, very interesting because uh, when it was, still, it was still actually alive on the deck and some of our colleagues happened to notice that the teeth inside the roof of the mouth appeared to be moving independently. So this fish is just lying there and the teeth inside the mouth are moving. It was just quite bizarre. Wow. So maybe they have some sort of control over the roof of the mouth. I hear there's an interesting story about one of the species of anglerfish from a field trip in 1968. Can you explain? Indeed. Yes, Agent One, there certainly is. Uh, this fish here is an amazing looking beast. Ceratius is its genus name. You can see it's got a huge, huge mouth. Very flobby body. Not much of a tail. So it's mostly stomach and mouth. Of course, at the top here, we've got the uh, the lure. <coughs> Pretty and impressive. That's tri trilobe. Yeah, trilobed lure. Yep. And you can see a hell of a hell of a mouth. Anyway, this particular fish, or one very very like it, ended up biting off more than it could chew. You can see with a mouth like that, you uh, you obviously think you can eat a lot of food. And in fact, what happened is you can see the fish here. What we're looking at here. There's the trilobed lure. There's the fish itself, its teeth. It's got a rat tail stuck in its mouth, and these two fish were found dead, floating on the surface. Obviously, this horned two rod angler has bitten off far more than it could chew, and the two of them died as a result. <laughs> Not a good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes bigger than its stomach. Eyes bigger than its stomach, indeed. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mark.